All right, am I on? Can you hear me? All right, well, good afternoon. I know you've already had a full morning, and hopefully your stomachs are nice and full with a good Sabbath lunch. Um, we start a little journey today, and this journey involves the gift of prophecy, doesn't it? And particularly, we're going to start to unpack the books of Daniel and Revelation, which we understand have to be read together, that the two unfold one another, a little bit like the Old and the New Testament read together give us a full picture. So to Daniel and Revelation, when read together, give us a full picture. In fact, when you get to the book of Revelation, you're going to find that it is basically impossible to understand the book of Revelation unless you have a good working knowledge of Daniel. And in fact, going further than that, unless you've got a good working knowledge of the Old Testament, you're going to find it very difficult to understand the book of Revelation and to draw its meaning from those Old Testament stories that are alluded to. So, of course, we're going to do what we should do, which is start in the beginning, and that means going back to Daniel. Now, I figured that most of us that are attending this afternoon would have probably have gone through some sort of prophecy seminar or studied prophecy at some point in time. So this first study, I'm going to try and combine what we would normally do in three studies and take care of the easier bits all at once. So we're going to look at a parallel between Daniel 2, 7 and 8. Daniel 2, 7 and 8 observing the parallels between them, putting them together so that you can see the pattern. Now, the books of Daniel and Revelation are really books of pattern. You have to notice the pattern, and very often the pattern that is followed is one of revise and enlarge. So the first vision in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, and Daniel is comprised of both narratives and prophecies or visions. We're dealing particularly with the visions today, as opposed to the actual historical narratives. The first vision is in Daniel chapter 2, and that sets the stage. If you get Daniel 2 wrong, you get the rest wrong. So we've got to get Daniel 2 right. But I think that most of you know Daniel 2. Daniel 7 gets a lot more complicated, but what happens in Daniel 7 is that in different symbols, the same story is repeated as in Daniel 2. But there's also a few elements of that which is new, an enlargement. Daniel 8 comes along, and years later, another vision is given using different symbols. The same history is covered, but with a few nuances of difference, in fact, sometimes between these prophecies, the differences may span several years and involve some quite intricate details. So Daniel 7 and 8 is where it really gets to be a lot of fun. But we're not going to deal with the complicated elements uh, today from Daniel 7 and 8. All we're going to do is establish the pattern so that you can see the parallels and you know the history part of it. Then when we get together next time, we'll start to look at some of the uh, more intricate and more detailed parts. Is that fair enough? Okay, so I hope you've got your Bible. And as I said to you, Daniel 2 is the one you've got to get right. But <clears throat> despite that statement, I want to start with Daniel 8. Start with Daniel 8, and then we'll work our way backwards to Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. <coughs> so Daniel 8 starts like this. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me to Daniel. After the one that appeared to me the first time. He then in verse 2 gives where he saw himself standing in the vision. And then Daniel 3, he starts, he says, I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. So they not only, not only is one grown to be bigger than the other, but there seems to be a slightly different timing between the growth of these horns. Yet at some point they're there together. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. 
Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. I saw him confronting the ram, and he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. So the way the ram began by, by, by expanding in different directions, killing other animals, is essentially how the ram itself comes to an end. It is confronted by a newer animal, and that animal gains the ascendancy and destroys him. Therefore the male goat grew, verse 8, very, uh, very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. There is a complicated phrase in the Hebrew as well for us to consider. The question that I would ask you to think about, which I won't tell you right now, but the question I would ask you to think about, and again, this is where the patterns come in to help us. Even if you don't know the Hebrew, if you know the patterns, you can begin to determine how to interpret this phrase. But the challenge comes in with this phrase. The question is, does, as it says here, after the large horn is broken, and in place of it, four notable ones, four notable horns, come up, right? The question being, do, do those four horns come up in the place, or out of the winds, or out of the broken horn? And depending on how you answer that small, seemingly insignificant question, you start to go in two vastly different directions with this prophecy. Does that make sense to you? Does the horn come up out of the broken, do the, do the four little horns come up out of the broken horn, or does it come up out of the winds? Okay. And then it goes on to describe um, in verse 9 where it says, And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. Okay. So, I think I've asked you, I've phrased that question incorrectly. We have a little horn, we have four little, we have one big horn, four little horns, and a fifth little horn. You with me? One big horn, four little horns, and a fifth little horn. The little horn that comes up, the fifth one, does it come out of one of the four winds or out of one of the four horns? Did you get that? The last little horn, the fifth little horn, does it come up out of one of the four winds or out of one of the four horns? Okay. Then the rest of this, almost the rest of this passage here, deals with, uh, from verse 10 and onwards, the conquering of the little horn. It grows up toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. And then it goes into describing another kind of warfare, which is essentially a spiritual one. He exalts himself against the Prince of the Most High. He causes the stars to fall. He uh, sets himself up as opposition. He takes away the daily, etc., etc., etc. That complicated passage we're not going to take on today. That's for another, for another study. But those are the antics of the little horn. Fair enough? And then, of course, you have that famous prophecy, you know, how long will this go on? And the answer is unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Again, that one's two whole studies later on. Okay. Now we jump down to verse 20. And here is the interpretation. Remember the old principle that we've advocated as a people for so many years, which if you follow, you cannot go wrong. And that is that the Bible must interpret itself. The Bible is its own expositor. And so here are these symbols. What do they mean? Well, I don't suck a meaning out of my thumb. I don't get high on drugs and try and figure it out in my imagination. The Bible gives us the keys if we search the Scriptures. And so here is the interpretation, verse 20. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Is that straightforward? Mm. Am I speaking too fast? Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so we've got two animals and a horn, or a series of horns, right? And essentially what we have is the rise and the fall of nations here, okay? And the way we know that is because of the interpretation which is given here. The ram which you saw is, the ram which you saw is Media and Persia. 
Media and Persia. Or Media Persia, as we would call it, right? So what we know then is that the animals were merely symbols. Happy with that? That what was portrayed here was not some end-time battle of the beasts out in the South African wild bush. This is a political rise and fall of nations. Okay? So you have the ram, a symbol of Medo-Persia. The horns, the symbols of the kings of Medo-Persia. Historically, what we know is that Medo-Persia, what we call Medo-Persia, was made up of two nations that amalgamated. Well, maybe amalgamated is not entirely the right word. The Persians conquered the Medes. They were the greater ones. The Persians were the dominant ones. But they had this interesting relationship and they alternated kings and they didn't just destroy the Medes, as it were. They became like an integrated kingdom together. And that's why you have on this ram two horns. And the one comes up slightly later than the other, and the one is greater than the other. Because there was always an imbalance. Although they existed together and became one, there was still a technical imbalance between the Medes and the Persians, with the Persians being the dominant ones. All right? The prophecy then went on to say that, well, the ram wouldn't last forever, meaning Medo-Persia would come to an end. Okay? Verse 21. The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Is that spelled out for you? Do we need to figure it out? It's right there, right? The male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Now we've got another symbol, and we've got another interpretation. Essentially, a horn and an animal, or a beast, represents the same thing. A king or a kingdom. Basically the same thing, right? The ram which you saw with the two horns are the kings of Medo-Persia. The next animal that you saw, the goat, it represents the nation of Greece. And the horn that is between its eyes is its first king. So why does God use two different symbols to represent the same thing? Is he just being complicated? No, because the relationship between the horns and the animals indicate a relationship between the kings and the nation. In other words, what God is highlighting here is he wants us to take note of the first king of Greece. The horn grows out of the animal. So the animal is the overall kingdom, but the horn is the king that rules the kingdom. Which is interesting because just now we're going to read a passage about a grotesque beast with no description and no comparison to anything on earth in Daniel chapter 7. And out of it grows ten horns. And you'll see what I mean between the relationship between the horns and the beasts, especially when we get there. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall ar arise out of that nation. There you go. Even in the interpretation... The relationship, two different symbols, meaning the same thing. Why? Because even in the interpretation that is spelled out. Because those four kingdoms, ruled by four different kings, arose out of the first kingdom. In other words, they were not new invaders that came from the outside and conquered. As is the case between Medo-Persia and Greece. Two se completely separate and different animals, right? Because they had nothing to do with each other, but they came up against each other and conquered. Right? That's not how Greece fell. Only later on. The initial fall of Greece was precipitated, as you know, by the first king, Alexander the Great, who died suddenly and unexpectedly when he became ruler of the then known world by about the age of 25 and then mysteriously and suddenly died. Now when you're that old or that young, you are not making plans for succession. 
because you're going to live forever, right? Well, he died. And as some history books have it, on his deathbed, he had four major generals. And on his deathbed, he said to them, instead of appointing one to rule, he said, the stronger shall rule. Which meant what? War. Same way he had conquered the world, he expected his generals to settle the score. And those generals had developed entire armies that were loyal to them because they were all fighting off in different areas of the world, right? Under the Grecian banner, under the overall leadership of Alexander. But those troops were loyal to those individual generals. Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and Lysimachus. Those are the names of the four generals. Just a little bit of trivia for you. So if any of you are planning on having sons, there's four great names to choose from. Okay. And the two dominant ones in the end were Ptolemy and Seleucus. The house of Ptolemy, or the Ptolemy, Ptolemy dynasty, and the Seleucids. And so just as Alexander had said, these four would wage war against one another. Now you see, they became separate kingdoms, as it were. They were still Greece. But they were essentially separate kingdoms. But God doesn't illustrate these as new and distinct empires using the metaphor of new animals because they were really just subdivisions of Rome. Do you understand what we're saying? Two symbols representing the same thing, but the horn connected to the animal indicates a relationship between the kingdom afterwards and the kingdom before in which the latter kingdom grows out of the former kingdom, as opposed to an entirely new kingdom coming and conquering the old kingdom. Got that? Digested it? So you can already, if you've got a prophecy background, begin to make sense of why in Daniel 7, the fourth beast has ten horns that grow out of it. Because that kingdom was not conquered by another. All right. Okay, and then it just goes on to continue with the, illust the uh, explanation here and speaks about the vision of the mornings and the evenings, which will come to another day. So a beast or an animal, and by the way, let me just pause there for a moment and say, the word beast is not a derogatory term. Can you digest that? You know, sometimes when we use the, the term beast... It's interpreted as a derogatory term, particularly when you discover the interpretation of Daniel 7's, um, or sorry, Revelation chapter 13's beast that comes up out of the sea. And we identify this well known, well accepted, respected entity as a beast. It almost it comes across sometimes as if we're trying to insult them. No, a beast is simply an animal. Does that make sense to you? It's not an insult. It's simply a symbol. And so a beast simply represents a political power or entity. A horn represents a political power or an entity or a king. And those, the difference between the king and the kingdoms are kind of fluid. As you see, on the one hand, the major horn here represented the first king specifically. On the other hand, the four little horns in the interpretation were said to represent the four kingdoms. So king, kingdom, interchangeable with these symbols. Okay, now, now, when you have the fifth horn, that little, that little horn, you had the four little horns, and out of one of them came the little horn, that is a king or a kingdom. Okay? So you have two animals in Daniel 8, two kingdoms, and then you have a the division of the one animal into the four horns, and then you have an entirely different horn. Or is it? Did it come up out of the four winds, or did it come up out of the four horns? Let me explain to you the difference. If it came up out of the four winds, let me get the phraseology right. Verse 8. A large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Those four winds of heaven indicate 
as we might use the analogy today, the four directions of the compass. It's a, it's a metaphor or it's a symbol for the world. Out of the four winds, winds are often ascribed to strife, turmoil. You find the same thing when it speaks, uh, when it speaks in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. And it speaks about the winds that are to blow on the earth and the angel that restrains them. In other words, the commotion and the turmoil that goes across the world, north to south, east to west. So, if the little horn comes up out of one of the four winds, then that indicates that it is a unique New, different entity. If it comes up out of one of the four horns, then it is an element of Greece. Get the difference? So, what was the fourth kingdom according to the visions of Daniel? We know what the middle two are. Medo-Persia. Greece, what came up after Greece? Rome. Okay. Now, and I'll show that to you in Daniel 7, but let me illustrate it more clearly. If this fifth little horn comes up out of one of the four horns, the divided kingdom of Greece, then it is a king within the Grecian Empire. And within the Christian world today, the interpretation of this, that is the majority view. That is the majority view. And so this little horn in Daniel 8 is not the kingdom of Rome. And it is certainly not going to be papal Rome. The little horn in Daniel 8 then becomes a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. One single king in the Seleucid house of the Grecian Empire, which means that whatever this desecration of the sanctuary is that's described in Daniel 8 has nothing to do with what you and I know and believe to be the sanctuary. It means that whatever happens with this little horn character, the Grecians were overthrown by Rome by 168 BC. Are you with me? So that makes this entire prophecy in Daniel 8 have nothing to do with the future, nothing to do with a heavenly sanctuary, nothing to do with Jesus, and everything to do with the Jewish nation and what happens in their earthly sanctuary by the latest 200 odd years before Christ even comes. So Daniel 8 has no bearing for you or for me. It was given just to Daniel for the Jewish people. Do you understand the consequences of getting that wrong? Adventists come along and we say, no, we don't believe that that little horn came up out of one of the four horns. The grammatical structure involving both number and gender, it most closely correlates to the phrase when it says the four winds of heaven. You know, in Hebrew, you have both gender and number. We do too, singular, plural, you have masculine and feminine. And the wording that's involved there grammatically connects the rise of the little horn to what? The four winds. Indicating that this is not a Grecian king. This is an entirely new king and kingdom. Which conquers and destroys the four Grecian kings. Now that's the complicated argument. Just so that you know, there is a complicated argument. You don't have to remember the complicated argument. All you have to know is the pattern. The pattern. So now you go to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Verse 2. I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Revelation 17, verse 15, I think it is, will tell you that water represents peoples, multitudes, nations, etc. So yeah, you have these four winds whipping up the peoples, the nations, the multitudes. Turmoil, in other words, a, an, a fancy term, an imbalance in power. 
Just as the wind is caused by an imbalance between high and low pressure, yeah, you have four winds that blow on the sea, a symbol of the people, and it's whipping them up. Imbalance of power. That needs to be settled. And four great beasts came up from the sea, from the people, each different from the other. The first was like a lion. It had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth. Where do ribs come from? They grow on trees. It's been eating, right? Those ribs had to come from another animal, which means what has been going here. If you translate the symbolism, if a beast is a political power or entity and it's got the remains of another animal in its mouth, what has it been doing literally? War, destruction, conquering. Okay. All right, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Oh, okay, so this is a third animal. So we're on our third political power, right? The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts which were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels of burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And thousands of thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, the books were opened. That's a picture of what? Judgment picture of judgment quite right and it goes on to describe the whole thing here it gives you more information in Daniel 30, uh, verses 13 and 14 in regard to the nature of the of the judgment or the outcome of the judgment and then we jump down here in verse 17 it says those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth is your symbolism explained is it in harmony with Daniel chapter 8 Kingdoms, kings, yes, okay. And then when you jump down to verse 23, it says that the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So in verse 17, it says four kings, and in verse 23, it says a, the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. So the word king and kingdom are used interchangeably. The beasts represent the kings that rule the kingdoms. You got that? So kings and kingdoms. And the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. Now here's what we know so far. that We have the identity in Daniel 8 of two beasts. Medo-Persia and Greece. What the identity that was not given was the little horn. Store that in the back of your mind. What we have in Daniel 7 is the principle explained. Four beasts. Each beast represents a kingdom. Four beasts, four kingdoms. Now you jump to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now Daniel chapter 2, we'll skip over reading this. I'm sure you know this one very well. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel gets given a vision on behalf of the king. And he gets shown in dream what God showed the king, Nebuchadnezzar. An image made of different types of metal, head of gold, Arms and breast of silver, thighs of bronze, two legs of iron, and then the feet were iron and clay. Then, of course, the stone comes out from nowhere, 
specifically mentioned, not cut, out without, not cut out with human hands. In other words, it's of divine origin, independent of mankind. Something miraculous happens, an intervention, and basically destroys all those metals, and they get blown away into oblivion. Happy with that? Is that as you recall it? The rock then grows to fill up the entire earth. Okay, so when you come in Daniel 2, and you take a note of... Daniel's explanation, he gives us the identity of the first power, which was who? Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar. Because he says here to the king from verse 37, O king, uh, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. You are the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Now, what do the different types of metal represent? The same thing as the different beasts. How do I know that? Because then he goes on to say in verse 39, but after you, after you, King Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold represented by this metal, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another third kingdom of bronze, so he's equating kingdoms with the different types of metal. Does that make sense to you? So it's just different symbolism for exactly the same thing as the beasts. Beasts, kings or kingdoms. Metals, kings or kingdoms. And in the same way that in Daniel 7 and 8, some beasts are completely independent to each other, come up against one another, destroy one another, so too you have completely different types of metal. There's no blending between these metals. There's one metal gold, another silver, another bronze, and another iron. Clean changes. Are you with me? Except for when you get to where? The feet. That's interesting. Because then you have a metal mixed with clay. Indicating some sort of change, but also some sort of continuity. Which is interesting, because in Daniel chapter 7, you had a fourth beast, same thing, there were four different types of metal, clean breaks, and in Daniel chapter 7, we had four different beasts, is that right? Independent of one another, but the last beast, the fourth one, the equivalent to the fourth metal in Daniel 2, is replaced by horns... Whereas in Daniel 2, instead of a new metal, there's elements of the metal that continue, but there's a mixture that takes place. Do you notice that parallel? So clean change, clean change, clean change, mixed change, different sort of change. One nation replaces the other through military conquest. Clear, unmistakable, this is the date, this is the date, this is the date. Babylon, 605 to 539. Medo Persia, 539 to 331. What comes after Medo Persia? Greece, 331 to 168. Rome, 168 to 476 AD. Of course, remember. When you're in B.C., you're counting backwards. That's why the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And in A.D., you're counting forwards, so the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. An easy way to remember it is the cross is the center of all time. So from the cross looking that way, you count forward. From the cross looking that way, you're also counting forward, just in the other direction. Okay? So, clean changes. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. One conquers the other. But after Rome, there was no new world empire, was there? In Daniel chapter 2, it was specifically mentioned. Let me find the verse for you. Look at verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And then verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly fragile. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. 
there would be attempts to reunite this world empire, to go back to the glory days of empires instead of monarchies, divided monarchies, you know, democracies, socialist governments, and all those of our present day, not even dictatorships, but go back to the days of the empire. There would be attempts to reunite that mighty European nation, if you like. The prophecy said they would not succeed, and to this day they haven't succeeded. But the parallel being four new kingdoms, one after the other with those dates, paralleled in Daniel 7 under the imagery of beasts, devouring, consuming one another, again paralleled in Daniel 8. However, in Daniel 8, we only had two beasts and that horn, right? Why is that? Because by the time the prophecy of Daniel 8 comes, and by the way, there were many years between Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. You know, you read the book in a few hours and you think, oh, you know, they must have come like, you know, one night I have this dream and the next night I have another dream. It wasn't like that. There were years, many years between some of these visions. So that by the time you get Daniel 2, would have been in the beginning of Daniel's captivity, you know, the story of them being taken to Babylon. And so over here, he's just establishing the rapport with the king. God gives this intervention and establishes Daniel in the sight and in the favor of the king. That's in the beginning of his tenure in the palace under King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 8 is at the end. In fact, it's no longer under Nebuchadnezzar. Who's it under? No, not quite. Who came after Nebuchadnezzar? Belshazzar, right? Belshazzar. In fact, if you have a look quickly at Daniel chapter 7, just so that you can catch an idea of the time lapse, if you look at Daniel 7, it starts in the first year of Belshazzar. Now, what do we know? Between Daniel 2 and Belshazzar, there are probably, there's probably more than a decade there easily. Why? What else happened to King Nebuchadnezzar during the time of Daniel? He went, he went nuts. Yeah, God humbled him, right, for his vanity. How long was he out there with the beasts of the field? Seven years. And so there's time before and there's time afterwards. We're talking easily a decade here, maybe more than that. And now Daniel 7 comes to him in the first year of Belshazzar. Then when you look at Daniel 8, it says, In the third year of the reign... Of King Belshazzar. So that again is years between, right? And what's about to happen to Belshazzar? Belshazzar about to disappear off the, off the scene of action, right? And that's in the narrative of that drunken feast and the handwriting on the wall and Daniel is called in and all of that. That's the narrative that more or less correlates time wise to this vision. And so when God gives Daniel this vision in Daniel 8, he doesn't start with Babylon. Why? It's Babylon's already been weighed, found wanting, and has been given into the hands of Medo-Persia. So in Daniel chapter 8, you don't start with Daniel like you do in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. So you only have two animals there and a horn. So you have one kingdom, two kingdom, three kingdom. In Daniel 7... You have one kingdom, two kingdom, three kingdom, four kingdom. Daniel 2, you have one kingdom, two kingdom, three kingdom, four kingdom. Clean changes, having nothing to do with each other, conquered one another, one replaces the other. And then the parallel of the change between Daniel 2 and 7 is that the fourth kingdom would not pass away by military conquest in the same sort of manner where one world empire conquers another world empire. In Daniel 2, the iron would remain in some form, but it would be mixed with ceramic clay. And in Daniel chapter 7, there would be 10 divisions, just like there were 10 toes on the image. How do I know there were 10 toes? Number one, it was the image of a man. And number two, the toes are specifically referenced in Daniel chapter 2. Right? So just like there are 10 divisions in Daniel 7, it would seem that there are 10 divisions in Daniel chapter 2. You see all those parallels? So coming back to that age-old question that we've been puzzling over that I gave you a complicated answer for, if you understand the pattern, 
that in Daniel 2, you go Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, new entity. And that happens in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Daniel 8 begins with Medo-Persia because Babylon is already finished, just about. So then we would be completely breaking the pattern for us to go Medo-Persia, Greece, more of Greece, still more of Greece, terminating with Greece. Having nothing to do with anything else. But the pattern suggests otherwise. It would go Medo-Persia, Greece. There's a little bit of extra detail in there on the nation of Greece and its division and how weakness comes into it. And then all of a sudden there is a new entity that shows up entirely different. It arises out of the four winds and it destroys the four horns. Rome. Does that make sense to you? Did you digest that all? So note the patterns. Revise and enlarge. Revise and enlarge. Now, here's a little bit of something interesting for you. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And we're looking here, of course, at this little horn that comes up. So we already said there's this grotesque beast. The other ones could compare, be compared to that which we know, you know, a lion and a leopard and so on, a bear and so on. But all of a sudden, he sees this fourth beast. He cannot compare it to anything that you and I know in the animal kingdom. It's ferocious. It's vicious. It's cruel. Even the description, it stomps, it tramples, it's throwing a temper tantrum, and nothing can stand in its way. There's connections there with Daniel 2 because it has iron teeth, and this is the fourth beast, and iron was the fourth metal in Daniel 2. So we see a connection there as well, and it just annihilates everything that was before, right? So cruel is it and so powerful that he cannot compare it to anything in the human animal kingdom. Then he says that this beast meets its, well, he doesn't really say it meets its end as such, but up out of this beast grows ten horns and then a new one. Which is an interesting pattern again because in Daniel 8 there was also just an observation, four horns and then a new one. But here we have ten horns and then a new one. The new one is different to the ten before that because it has no, the ten before it had no real human qualities or characteristics. But this one does. Eyes of the eyes of a man, a mouth speaking great words, etc. And so you can imagine Daniel is troubled by this. He's messed up in his head. You know, the other stuff, yeah, okay, whatever. But what is the meaning of this beast? What is the meaning of this little horn? And then you go on to notice something interesting in the, in, in the um, explanation that's given. It says here from verse 23, a fourth kingdom, uh, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth. It shall be different from the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it, break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. Right? So there, that's interpreted as well. Who shall arise from this kingdom. Rome was not conquered by a mighty army from the outside. They were, of course, the marauding bands of barbarians. By the way, you and I use that term barbarian today as an insult. You know, oh, what a barbarian. Meaning akin to, what an idiot. You know, no education. It's just, just a fool. You know what a barbarian really is? Someone who has a beard. Barbs. Because the Romans were clean shaven. The tribes invading from the outside with whom they made combat were barbarians. They were bearded ones. Of course, to the Romans, they were also a bunch of fools. So I guess... The two ideas became synonymous, but you get what we mean? Okay. So, yes, there were, of course, military attacks from the outside, but not by a world kingdom as such. Rome was conquered almost from within in that it lasted the longest from 168 BC to 476 AD. That's close to 600 odd years, if you do the math, longer than any of the other kingdoms. But it became rich, increased with goods, lazy. And it fell apart from the inside. By the way, 
just an observation. What you see happening in the United States of America today, and books have been written about this, parallels the fall of Rome. All the characteristics that historians have determined that led to the demise of Rome are today present in the United States of America. Interesting. Just an observation. It'll make a lot more sense when you get to the book of Revelation, chapters 13 and 14 later on. Okay. Now, what I was trying to get to here was it says here, verse 25, that the activities of this little horn is that he speaks pompous words against the Most High, persecutes the saints of the Most High, intends to change times and laws, Again, the context would indicate of the Most High. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for time, times, and dividing of time. I'm not getting into all of that. All I'm highlighting there is the difference between the ten horns and the eleventh little horn that comes up is a religious dimension. The other ten horns, all they were interested in was their little piece of land and their power. Down here. They wanted their chunk of the mighty kingdom of Rome. This little horn... He's not interested in that so much as he is in his spiritual territory. And he becomes an opponent to God. Happy with that? Now, where is that paralleled elsewhere? Is that something new? Actually, the seeds of it are in Daniel 2. Because you will notice in Daniel 2 that it says the following. We're looking at verse 41. It says, whereas you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay, what's it called? What type of a clay? Potter's clay. And partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of it shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. So can we agree that ceramic clay and potter's clay, same thing? Okay. Now go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah, going backwards here, Isaiah 45. Where are we? Isaiah 45 from verse 9. It says, Woe to him who strives with his maker. So what are we talking about here? Spirituality, aren't we? We're talking about woe to those who resist God's attempt in their lives. Woe to them who strive with their maker. Happy with that? And then it goes on to use an illustration to describe what this looks like. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? So he turns to the analogy between potter and clay. And he's saying, who are you to argue with God? God is the maker of you. He's shaping you. He's transforming you. How can you be arguing with God and resisting his intervention in your life? That would be as daft as the potter, potting clay saying to the potter who's working it, hey, I don't want to be this kind of a jar. I want to be this or I want to be that. That analogy is again picked up on by Isaiah in chapter 64. Even more clearly, verse 8, 64 verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are the, we are the clay, you are the potter, and all we are the work of of your hands. Of all the symbolism, of all the analogies that God gives to Daniel in describing the end of the Roman Empire, 
which until this point has basically been all about territorial, territorial conquest down here on earth. It's been one nation that's stronger than another saying, I want what you have. I want the status you have. I want your gold, your resources, your everything. So I'm going to take it from you. That's normal, everyday conquest. We still fight those conquests today. We just do it in a more democratically and politically correct way. We find other reasons to do the same thing, right? That's territorial expansion. But the difference is that Daniel 2 highlights is that when Rome ends, the division will be marked no longer with a purely political objective, but that the religious element will come in in the form of the potter's clay. That the element of Rome and its political continuance and influence will be there, but at the same time, there will be a strong element of the religious. Almost like as if in Daniel 7, when you get to the little horn, you clearly discover that is a horn representing a king or a kingdom, a political entity, but he accomplishes a spiritual objective. So he uses his secular power to accomplish some sort of spiritual offensive against God. He's not only interested in a political conquering, but in a spiritual conquering, the seeds of that are already in Daniel chapter 2. Because the iron of Rome is mixed with the potter's clay, a symbol of God's fashioning and forming and of spiritual involvement in individual lives. And that the division into the ten tribes from Rome would be followed or would lead to this agenda of the union between church and state, which Daniel 7 comes along and expressly you know, fills in the detail of and explains in far greater detail, and which we again find coming up in Daniel chapter 8 and then Revelation chapter 13. In Daniel chapter 8, that little horn represents the same overall entity as in Daniel 7 is represented by the big grotesque beast with the ten horns of division and the eleventh tiny little horn that comes up. That whole imagery is summarized in Daniel 8 under one image, the little horn. How do I know that? Because in Daniel chapter 8 it says the following. Just lost my place, of course. Daniel 8 and it says this. Verse 9, out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. That is the phase of the big, ugly, grotesque beast in Daniel chapter 7. Military conquest and expansion. Left, right, up, down, taking the world. But you see, in Daniel 8, that's not the focus. He's not just interested in the history. He's interested in the spirituality. In Daniel 7, the vision is given using unclean animals. In Daniel 9, the vision is given using clean animals. That's an interesting observation. Because the two animals that are used in Daniel chapter 8 are the, are, are the animals that were used in the sanctuary. And then the little horn goes on to attack the sanctuary. And the last part of the vision is about the restoration of the Sanctuary. Can you see the patterns coming through again? So in Daniel chapter 8, the little horn represents that entire period of political Rome and later on of papal Rome, of the union of church and state. And that's the particular focus in Daniel 8 because the bulk of what's said from verse 10 all the way down to the end of verse 12 is all about the spiritual dimension of the little horn. So next week, we pick up on some of these details and we start to look at some of the differences between these visions. Today, we've covered the parallels. Four kingdoms, clean changes, metals and beasts, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome or Europe as we know it today, followed by the stone which ends all earthly kingdoms. That is paralleled in Daniel 7 and 8. Daniel 7 is the scene of the judgment. The ancient of days is seated, the court, etc. The result of that is that the Son of Man is brought in and He receives a kingdom. That's like the stone of Daniel 2. And in Daniel 8, 
It's called the cleansing of the sanctuary. All of these visions looking at the same period of history, but taking it and looking at it like that age-old illustration of looking at a diamond. You look at it this way, you see something. You look at it that way from a different angle, same diamond, different facet. And when you circle the diamond and you look at all these different angles, you begin to get the full picture. So that's where we will have to sort of leave it today before you get too weary and don't come back next week. We covered a lot of ground today, right? Daniel 2, 7 and 8. And I hope we did it in a way... I didn't want to bore you by just going over Daniel 2 and leaving it there. I think you have a reasonable knowledge of prophecy. So I wanted to sort of combine those, move those out of the way, and then we can get into some of the more challenging stuff next time. Are there any questions on the stuff we've... or added comments or anything else? Did you absorb it all? No, that would be after the dividing. That would be after the dividing of Rome. But what is interesting is that Rome went through a change where it had an eastern and a an western arm. And of course, the statue being the statue of a man would have had a left and a right leg. And it's also interesting because the statue being the statue of a man had, with the chest and arms of silver, would have had two arms. And of course, we know that the Medo-Persians were a composite of two nations. <laughs>